Hi, someone asked me, what are the main things I need to include in a PCB footprint, right? Well, the answer to that question stems from the main problems that manufacturers face when they're building the printed circuit board. The top one has to do with incorrect PCB footprints and LAN patterns. And then again, we have things like insufficient solder mass coverage. At least two of the top five issues are related to PCB footprint creation. By the time you're done watching this video, you'll know what to include in your PCB footprint and why to avoid these issues. So if we look at top DFM issues, according to the VSE company and how we can prevent them, their top five list, first on their list is incorrect PCB footprints and LAN patterns. When they're incorrect, they can cause the components to float out of alignment. And there are other issues as well. So first of all, that's number one. So we need to get this right. Component location and orientation is the second one and component clearance is the third one. Now that has to do with part layout and placement. That's a different topic. How do we place the parts? Issue number four, biggest issue number four is insufficient solder mass coverage. How do we solve these issues? Well, let's look at a guide created by Tom Hosher and the IPC group where we discuss the anatomy of a printed circuit board library or footprint. Let's unpack the structure of a good LAN pattern. Silk screen pin 1 polarity. Here's an example of a chip where we have the pin 1 marker. We want to make sure that pin 1 for the chip aligns with pin 1 on the silk screen and this helps with inspection and testing. Now we have assembly pin 1 polarity. Why do we need one for silk screen? And why do we need an assembly pin 1 polarity as well? Why not just use one? Well, the assembly pin 1 polarity is for the machine that places the part. There are pick and place machines that pick up your components and place them onto the PCB automatically. And then there's this automatic soldering process and so on and so forth. The silk screen in general is going to be for manual part placement to help people visually see the silk screen, they won't be able to see the assembly. The machine uses the assembly to place the part, the assembly layer, see this line? The machine understands the polarity from this. All right, let's look at the IPC LAN size calculation. See how it says perfect IPC LAN size calculation? What does this mean? Well, the LAN is exposed copper for the device pin to land onto. If we look at this, these are the device pins, right? And they land onto the copper. There's exposed copper under here that they land onto. If we look at this here, we see ex we see copper lands that the capacitor chip falls onto. To calculate how much copper you're supposed to have, you get that information from the IPC standard. That's the IPC 7351, IPC 2221, and 2222 for other devices as well. Very important. Next is the one-to-one -one scale paste mask on all terminal LANs. What is, what is that? What is paste mask? Okay, so solder paste is solder material that you spread across the exposed copper pads. Let me show you. When you have your exposed LANs that we just talked about, right? These look a bit grainy because they have solder paste on them. If they were exposed, and didn't have any solder paste, they would look shiny, they would look more like this, right? Then somebody squeegees paste mask on it like this, and then the pads end up looking like this. Why do we do this? Because when you have this on your copper pads, you can place the entire printed circuit board onto a, a heater to spread the heat across the board evenly, or put it in a reflow oven. And then you want to put your components on top of your PCB. When you put it in that oven or put it on a board heater, it just melts like butter and solders your components perfectly onto the PCB. No manual soldering necessary. I recommend you take a look at some videos if you're not familiar with this process. It's extremely cool. I use it and it's very nice in the lab. So that is solder paste. 
A solder paste is solder material that you spread across the exposed copper pads to make automated soldering of components to your PCB that much easier. And why does it say one-to-one -one scale paste mask on all terminal lands? Because that's what works nicely when you're designing your footprint. That's what works. And you just keep it that way. And then the manufacturer can reduce or will most likely reduce or keep it the same depending on their manufacturing capability. Now let's look at center of gravity origin. What is that for? This is helpful for like a pick and place machine so it knows about which axis to rotate the component, also where to pick up the component. For surface mount devices, we do center of gravity for the origin. The center of gravity origin for the part in general would be marked on the footprint, so you need that. Okay, let's take a look at one-to-one -one solder mask size on all lands. Why do we need one-to-one one -to -one solder mask size? Okay, well, let's look at solder mask first of all. Solder mask is a material on the PCB that prevents solder from getting onto the traces. See, this solder mask is protecting this trace from any solder. It masks the PCB from solder, hence solder mask, from getting onto the trace. But these parts that are exposed, this is called solder mask. Well, really, this is negative solder mask. And the bit that goes beyond the copper pad is called solder mask swell or solder mask expansion. How much more or larger than the copper pad will the solder mask opening be? We want to expose these copper pads so that solder can get to the copper. In certain PCB design software, you will use a negative film to represent solder masks so that you would see the gaps instead of seeing the solder mask as the filled in parts. Now, let's go back to what it says about one-to-one -one solder mask size. Why one-to-one? Why -one? What that means is that the solder mask shape here needs to match the pad exactly so these solder mask clearances the swell is too is for, for practical purposes this is what it's supposed to look like in the end but when you're designing the solder mask clearance make it the exact same size right around the edge as the pad okay so why would we do that why wouldn't we force the solder mask to be a bit larger like how they're supposed to be the reason is because nowadays a lot of manufacturers want you to do it this way and they can use their own software to increase or may, maybe decrease but usually increase just a little based on their manufacturing capabilities that's why you want the one-to-one -one. a lot of times you don't have to do manually increase the solder mask yourself for some manufacturers you have to but for a perfect footprint a standard footprint you can leave it one-to-one -one. that is you can have the solder mask clearance the same size as the exact same size as the land okay what do we have here 50 percent paste reduction on thermal pad broken into squares okay we talked about solder paste right let's take a look at a qfn on the underbelly of it we have this pad this can be for ground but many times it's for thermal dissipation so these chips, they do a lot of calculations sometimes. And so like with microprocessors, they'll have this pad under here to help, to help you connect it to the PCB so the PCB can pull away the heat that's produced. These chips can get hot. The heat can't be distributed as well through these small tiny pads. So we use a big pad underneath here, under the, under the belly, solder it to the copper. Copper is very good, not only conducting electricity, but at heat as well, which is fantastic. And what's it saying? It's saying that you make little solder paste patterns broken into squares that are 50% reduced. They don't cover, we don't want them to cover up the entire space here of the underbelly. We want it to cover up partially. Why? Because when we squish that down, when we place this device and flip it over and put it onto the PCB, onto that solder paste, the solder paste is going to spread. Especially when it heats up, it'll spread. And then you'll get a nice, 
flat soldering uh, coating that's evenly distributed that perfectly solders the underbelly of this chip onto the printed circuit board copper. If you put too much here, then the chip is going to sort of float a little on the solder paste that's turned into molten solder. Now we don't want that. Next, we have the IPC7351 three tier placement courtyard external boundary with 0.01 .01 millimeter line width. What does that mean? Okay, let's focus on IPC7351. Let's break this down. IPC7351 generally is the is the de facto standard for producing high quality PCB footprints. The higher quality your PCB footprints are, the more reliable your printed circuit boards are going to be, the less issues you're going to have. And remember, top design for manufacturing issues that manufacturers have with PCBs, incorrect foot PCB footprints and land patterns, things floating about the place, all right, and other issues. So let's go back. That's why we have the IPC7351. It, all right, that help guides us with the numbers. Now let's look at three-tier placement courtyard. For this three-tier placement courtyard, here we have the three tiers for least environment, meaning the higher density courtyards, uh, higher density printed circuit boards, where you need to pack more components into a tighter space. Nominal environment, this is for standard electronics. And most environment for robust, rugged PCB layouts. And the courtyard is going to vary. But what will stay the same is that 0 0.01 millimeter line width, which is very tiny. That's less than a thousandth of an inch. It's about a third of a mil in line thickness. So you have to determine this based on the density of your PCB. You have to use the right footprints. Next, we have the assembly outline map to maximum component body width, okay, with 0 0.1 millimeter line width. Why 0 0.1 millimeter line width? I'm not exactly sure. This is equivalent to about four thousandths of an inch for the line thickness for the assembly. First of all, this assembly outline helps the assembly machine make sure that the component that it automatically places and assembles on the PCB fits where it's supposed to. And this needs to be the same size as the maximum component body. The component body refers to the chip itself. So the edge of this component, your outline needs to match that. The assembly outline, that is. Not the courtyard, but the assembly, this orange thing. Next, we have the silkscreen outline with a line width of 0 0.12 millimeters. If you round that up, that's about five thousandths of an inch or five mils. This is visible after assembly, or at least it's supposed to be. It may not always be the case. See, we don't have a silk screen on the outside, but these chips, they have silk screen on the outside here. See, it's visible after you assemble the part. And see this one as well? If this is sized correctly, it hopefully would be visible after a chip gets placed here. Likewise with this capacitor. Okay. And then this helps with visual, manual, human inspection. All right. Next, we have the reference designators. We have two ref desks. What does that mean? Two means we have two different reference designators that are both, that are each located on the inside of this footprint. So in your footprint, you need to have a reference designator for your silk screen and a reference designator set text for your assembly drawing. The assembly drawing reference designator helps the pick and place machine identify your part based on the schematic based on the original design and whatnot and for the silk screen we also place that here and here's the thing when you're designing you leave your silk screen reference designator on the inside as well as the assembly reference designator you finalize your part placement and when you're done with your routing and everything then you move the silk screen reference designator outside of the component and place it properly. Why? Because when you do your auto silk, whether it's an ORCAD or some other CAD software or Altium, you we can see the silk screen after the component is placed. So for instance, if you leave the silk screen under the component, then place your component, right? 
but we won't know that this is C149 if you place the part. We won't know how to identify this component, this device, once it's placed. That's why we place this whole screen on the outside. The assembly can be on the inside for the machine. Let's move on to the 0.15 millimeter land to land gap DRC check. What's that about? Typically, you don't have to worry about this. This might violate your general rules for the PCB overall, but what you would do is create or do something in your CAD software to ignore gap issues or gap errors within your component. Also for QFN, here we have the 0.2 millimeter thermal to land gap DRC check. For QFN, this needs to be it. Why? The thermal helps us, or the thermal connection to copper helps with the soldering and whatnot, and we just want to make sure that this is the gap. This is I, this is recommended by IPC standards. More information can be found on it the more you look into QFNs. Finally, there is the silk to land gap automatic DRC check. What does this mean? So this silk screen, this black line here, we want it at least 0.12 millimeters away from the edge of this land. Why is that? Well, there are a number of manufacturing issues you can run into if you put silk screen on top of copper or across uh, solder mask clearance. Okay, and so it can lead to several problems during soldering, assembly, and inspection if you don't have your silk screen far enough away from your solder mask opening. And if your solder, if your silk screen, excuse me, is too close to your copper pads, it could melt onto the pad and cause problems with soldering the pin into or onto the pad. Okay, finally, let's look at the thermal pad. Well, you want a thermal pad in your footprint because this defines a exposed copper area that you can solder the underbelly of your QFN to, to dissipate heat. The thermal pad defines that copper area to expose uh, along with your solder mask clearance, don't forget about that. And in addition, we have the solder paste reduction to, to let us know on our solder stencil. If we go back to our stencil here, this is the stencil and it's squeegeed. The stencil was taken off actually. When we put that solder paste on there, and then it ends up looking like this, we can have a nice reflow solder or oven uh, soldering going on that for automatic soldering of the components. Okay, so we've covered all the important parts of a QFN surface mount lamp pattern, and that pretty much covers most of surface mount footprints anyhow. Every feature here in this diagram prevents problems with assembly and manufacturing your printed circuit board. So try to make a footprint that has all of this information, whether you use ORCAD, Altium, KeyCAD, Eagle, it's up to you. Now, if you download from some third party resource, check. Check the footprint for these items. So, one thing is for sure though, you'll reduce problems for your PCB design by at least 40%. The more careful attention you spend on making or using quality footprints. Thank you for watching, and I hope this helps.